All right, Raphael is going to give us a walkthrough of how this thing works. Okay, a lot of you guys have seen this on the web already, but nevertheless, this is for for Sterling. Number one and number two pistons, that's where we start. That's the combustion chamber upstairs, combustion chamber on the bottom. So two firings every time. It's firing every 45 degrees. So this is uh, intake, that's exhaust, this is exhaust, this is intake rotation is this way so that's pulling in the charge that's intake it compresses it it ignites it power stroke and exhaust and that's also happening same event is happening on the bottom so two firings so we start at one and two that's two firings four six eight 10, 12, and 16. Well, actually, I kind per, of per cycle. 16 per 360 revolution, or one mm -hmm. complete rotation. Since it's a four stroke, a four stroke has to do two times rotation, 720 degrees, instead of 360 to complete that four stroke. So if you did that, basically you're 32 firings for two rotation. So that's where you get it, you know. But basically, when once one one piston, there's two discs containing the four pistons individually, and uh, when one piston is dwelling, looks like it stopped. That's because of the dwelling at the crankshaft. The other one's moving. When it catches on, that's top dead center, and then basically now this one stops. It's dwelling, and then the other one keeps on moving. And it just alternates. Let's show the camshaft action that makes that happen, the dwelling effect. If you could, you have two crankshafts on each side of this H carrier that are spinning on a central gear that produces the motion of the pistons. You see, you can see it here. This is attached to this rod and that the crankshaft. The crankshaft is moving. That's dwelling. This is attached to the shaft on the piston. They're both stationary, but they're actually dwelling. You see the movement here. So when the other piston catches up, now this moves. The other side is now dwelling. See? There. The other side is now dwelling, which represents that piston, but it's still rotating there. So that's the dwell. You know, when you have a uh, rotating crank pin, you have your top, you have your bottom. This is the dwell area, the bottom is the dwell area, that's why it's called top dead center, bottom dead center. Rotation from this point, that's the central point, this rotation is a movement, that's a stroke. So is this. But at top dead center and bottom dead center, that's a dwell, which is what this is doing. So when you see that thing almost stationary, that's a result of the crank pin dwell. Or in this side, you can see it better in this side. There you go. That, that looks stationary, but that's moving. But it's because it's the dwell. It's at the bottom dead center, right there. And in, normal, in a normal engine, the dwell is how much percentage of the... Nothing. What oh. comes up must come down. And, and this one has a longer dwell time. Because it's geared 4 to 1. The gearing, this is one, 1 to 4 or 4 to 1. Mm. And you have 2. So the additional of that, when, you, when it catches up, when the, pit, when the piston catches up, see right there, when it catches up with the other one, that's top dead center. There's a total uh, dwell time of 14 degrees where it's top dead center. It carries over. You see this motion? See? That's 14 degrees before it goes away from top dead center. That's a lot of time to burn the fuel and air. Uh, so basically, we're able to burn more energy out of the fuel in the combustion chamber that by the time power stroke uh, happens or exhaust, there's nothing, burn, there's nothing left to burn on the exhaust. It actually is leading to a cooler exhaust temperature because there's nothing left to burn. To burn you need oxygen, 
and you need fuel. And so when one of those is, is not there, when the fuel is no longer, it's already burnt, there's nothing. So it will have actually cooler exhaust because there's no, nothing left, no, no fuel unburnt. On a normal engine, uh, unburnt fuel, and it's burnt on the catalytic converter, which is ridiculous. It's called waste. You know, why would you wait for unburnt fuel to come out to the engine and burn it in the catalytic converter? In this case, I burn it inside the combustion chamber because on, on all engines, it's zero duration. When the piston goes up, it has to come back down. It's less than one degree duration. This is 14 degrees duration, which means I'm using all of that energy to power up the engine and not wasting it. And by doing so, because I burn every energy, every ounce of that fuel, when the exhaust happens, there's nothing left to burn. So cleaner and no waste. And this one you could actually turn into a functioning engine by encasing it? This is the number two engine, yeah. But you're not going to do that because this is a new no, zone. No, it's too so. effective. Yeah. Uh, it, it's, it's very effective. Uh, the, the clanking effect is not supposed to be there. But we haven't fitted this. This came straight from the CNC machine. We put this together for the LA show and we haven't done anything to it other than it's a very effective demo tool. So those pistons are not supposed to be heating each other. Uh -huh. That's not supposed to be doing that. Uh -huh. We just haven't done the proper fitting on it. This came directly from CNC. Computer numerical control machines. This is all automatically done in the machine. And so the uh, appearance of the rest of the engine, would you would have the other half of this that would encase that. The block. And then would you the have like block. an oil pan down here? What would be? No, it's dry sump. Uh, oil is in, injected in with a power pump and it comes out with a scavenge pump and goes onto a separate reservoir. So it's, it's called dry sump unit. There's no oil pan in the bottom which means you can, lo you can locate it farther, uh, lower center gravity, so it makes the car handle even more, much more stable. And, the and then it, since it's a dry sum, you can orient it any which way you want. Up, backwards, sideways, whatever. So it's gravity independent. Because it's dry sum. Yeah, and on the, um, the first one you built, or you're calling it Mighty 2, the mm -hmm. That one you ran for six months on fuel, and then you converted it to run on... The, the P1, the prototype number one, which is what they've seen me running on the dyno, uh, that was originally uh, done for six months. The first six months on the table ran for on fuel, a combination of diesel number two, uh, B20, uh, and also 100% biodiesel soybean. Uh, short runs of them. As a matter of fact, the demo that we did for Lou Fakes, who did uh, the MYT uh, Lou Fakes report, which is on our website, that was done by by 100% uh, biodiesel, by not a timed, uh, no injectors on that, just a squirt motion on the intake. Uh, it's probably the only diesel engine on the planet that can run that way. And that has to do with the dwell. And the 14-inch engine is how, how many horsepower? Uh, three to 4,000, now higher, because now the, the advanced version of the 6-inch, when, when put on the 14-inch package, now becomes 1,000 cubic inches. So it's between five and 6,000 horsepower now. But this is the old model. Mm. The new model is the 6-inch. And the 6-inch will be how many horsepower? 200 is the basic. Mm -hmm. We have versions for F1, and we have version for the military, for the jet pack, that will put out as, as, as high as 800 horsepower from the 25-pound engine, MYT6. Mm -hmm. But beginning horsepower is 200. 200 horsepower for the flight pack is all I need. Thank you. Thank okay. You. Well, unlike the, the standard engine where each individual component does one specific thing, for example, an intake valve is just one. It, it handles 
the inflow of uh, uh, fuel and air and also seals the combustion chamber. On the exhaust valves, it does the same thing. Exhaust handles the exhaust and seals. A piston upward reciprocation that uh, draws the charge, compresses the charge. So each component in standard engine does one specific thing. Unlike the MYT engine, on this case, this piston acts as the piston that moves the air and compresses the air, but also at the same time, it acts as the valve. You know, basically it seals, it seals, it acts as the combustion chamber. So each component on the mighty engine does more than one function. On a normal engine, where you see a crankshaft, in this case a crankshaft, like a motorcycle crankshaft on both ends, is actually acting as a timing mechanism. Uh, and, and so basically each component that you see here, uh, 15 components is doing uh, between three to five different functions. So simple when you're looking at the individual part count, but when one individual component does a number of things anywhere from three to five different things, then it becomes complex. What's the, what about heating? What kind of heat? Do you have to have radiator? And the early runs, uh, we knew that we had some heating problems. And we started, we were going to air cool it, an air cool combination with oil cooling, but it wasn't enough and it was too cumbersome, you know. The radiator that's needed in this thing is about, about three feet to four feet wide and also the same length and about six inch thick. And it's massive. It doesn't make any sense. And besides, that's after the fact. That's taking care of the heat and you're wasting it by doing it that way. I've incorporated, since I have that well thing, I've incorporated to utilize that heat instead. And so I have a, uh, a controlled temperature, combustion controlled temperature, let's just leave it at that. The other stuff is proprietary, so I'm not air-cooled. This, this was, gee, this was not big enough fence for air-cooling. This is more of a structure and for aesthetic looks. Uh, my cooling is actually internal, so I have a proprietary system where I'm able to control that temperature now. And I'm able to, instead of wasting the heat, I'm using the heat. Let's leave it at that. It's proprietary induction and combustion process enabled by the carryover 14 degrees. Let's leave it at that. That's still very proprietary. That will be included in the next patent for the 6-inch engine, the advanced version of the Mighty Engine. This is the old dinosaur. This is our old dinosaur. The MYT-6 is an advanced version. So when that advanced version scaled down, is scaled back up to 14, this now becomes from 850 cubic inches to 1,000 cubic inches. It becomes bigger and also lighter. It's pretty awesome. And a lot of improvements in the internal as well, too. Parts that we broke down in the first six months had been redesigned completely. Not just, not just, because basically you can always use heavier gauge or thicker material, but that's, that's not the smart engineering. The smart engineering is redesigning it, and that's what we've done with the six inch. And so that's why the six inch falls below 25 pounds. Just imagine uh, an engine producing 200 horsepower for starters. That's that's bare minimum because it's 2.4 liter, uh, which is uh, I think 140 cubic inches, something 142 cubic inches, which is tiny engine. But again, that's like four V8 engines as well too. The same number of pulses that this has is carried through that. And so, uh, just imagine a 25 pound engine that puts out 200 horsepower. The size of the alternator. And it's that weight ratio, that can, um, weight to power ratio. The, the weight to power ratio might be lower than that because the components now will be taxed heavily because they're smaller components, so metallurgy has the limitation. This, having bigger parts, has a higher power to weight ratio. We can push this. We can't push that too much because that's, parts will start breaking on that because that's the, almost like a clock. And like a watch. Components are so tiny and everything else. So even with the strongest material, when you downsize 
the, uh, the cross sections, then you have less strength. And so that has, that won't attain the 40 to 1 power to weight ratio that this will. And you were a 10 inch would, but not a 6 inch. You're saying that a two 14 inch engines would power a vertical takeoff and landing craft? Two individual, yes. An eight, eight person uh, that could go to Mach 2. 8 to 12, actually. But the basic uh, aircraft is measured at the maximum speed with the maximum passenger. So my maximum passenger at my maximum speed, which is 1.4 Mach, or 1,078 miles per hour, is based on eight passengers. Now, we have a cargo space. You can put additional seating on that thing, and you can sit up to 12 people if that's what you want. But you won't be able to do Mach speeds. You'll have to do subsonic, so top speed 750, 760 miles per hour at 40,000 feet. With no landing gear, no wings. Correct. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Exhaust. This is exhaust. This is intake. Rotation is this way. So that's pulling in the charge. That's intake. It compresses it. It ignites it. Power stroke. And exhaust. And that's also happening. Same event is happening on the bottom. So two firings. So we start at one and two. That's two firings. Four, six, eight, ten, twelve, and sixteen. Well, actually, I kind per, of per cycle. Sixteen for three hundred and sixty revolution or one mm -hmm. complete rotation. Since it's a four stroke, a four stroke has to do two times rotation, 720 degree crankshaft, the other one's moving. When it catches on, that's top dead center, and then basically now this one stops, it's dwelling, and then the other one keeps on moving, and it just alternates. Let's show the camshaft action that makes that happen, the dwelling effect, if you could. You have two crankshafts on each side of this H carrier that are spinning on the central gear, all right, Raphael is going to give us a walkthrough of how this thing works. Okay, a lot of you guys have seen this on the web already, but nevertheless, this is for, for Sterling. Number one and number two pistons, that's where we start. That's the combustion chamber upstairs, combustion chamber on the bottom. So two firings every time. It's firing every 45 degrees. So this is uh, intake. That's exit instead of 360 to complete that four stroke. So if you did that, basically you have 32 firings for two rotation. So that's where you get it, you know. But basically, when one, when one piston, there's two discs containing the four pistons individually. And uh, when one piston is dwelling, looks like it stopped. That's because of the dwelling 